free. So I would like to have Paul West, researcher of the University of Minnesota. Uh, David Tonini, scientific of the European Commission. Aurélie Wickrab, researcher in, in HAE. I'm Ludwig Montastri, professor at PNP and CSS. And uh, Ligia Barna, professor in SA. And Laurie Amelin, researcher in, in HAE. So, Hugo, now is your turn. You have 45 minutes to present and to synthesize your, your work. Okay. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the jury. Welcome to the audience. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to present three years of work. And as you can see, it was mainly uh, focused around a specific set of process which transform waste into food and feed. So, up. So this is the first example of such process. Here you have a technology which transforms a kind of a mixture of straw, wood, and manure into something well, which is edible. So my first point here is that transforming waste into food and feed is not necessarily something new, even if we will see that now it can take various forms. So along this presentation, I will mostly use the term waste to nutrition to refer to all the technical solutions that we have to transform uh, organic residue into something directly edible. So the reason why I'm interested in these processes is that they are increasingly promoted as a solution to mitigate environmental impacts. So here I just display some recent initiatives, these three ones, they are, they are French ones. And what you can see is that the, the main marketing arguments is around sustainability. And reviewing a bit the narrative, it's mostly around the decoupling of food production from arable land and uh, the direct cycling of uh, nutrients, such as nitrogen and phosphorus, for example. So it's true in a sense that the current way we produce food and feed today is not sustainable. Uh, just looking at GHG emissions, it's generally acknowledged that food systems generate around a third of total emissions. So it's a key system to work on if one wishes to comply with the IPCC targets. I'm not mentioning the rest of the impacts such as eutrophication, land use, water use. But if I focus on GHG emissions, most of it, I won't get into the detail, but most of it can be uh, attributed to livestock production, either through the land, which is required to feed them, or through direct emissions, such as methane and manure management. So not all, but most of the novel food and feed pathways, they try to decrease the impacts of livestock production, either by um, substituting animal-based food, or by substituting the conventional way we have to produce feed ingredients. On the other hand, uh, we have a lot of residual biomass that is currently well, recognized to be unused or underused. So here, uh, it would be a great opportunity to make novel food and feed from them. But at the same time, in the framework of bioeconomy, the rest of the sectors, they also want to have alternative raw materials, biomaterials, biochemicals, bioenergy. So there, there is a need of increased uh, evidences to guide the use of constrained resources. So to come back to waste nutrition pathways at the end, uh, it remains unclear if they can really achieve net environmental benefits. First of all, because the whole panorama of the ways to transform waste into food and feed is itself unclear. Then, because um, they're mostly at early development scale, which means that we don't know their future scaled performance. And finally, because now they have mostly been assessed independently one from another with unharmonized methodology and also mostly performed by the technology promoters themselves, which means that we were not necessarily answering the same question. So what we propose with this work is to uh, address the following research question. How and under which condition can transforming waste into food and feed really uh, help the transition toward a sustainable bioeconomy? So I propose to divide this uh, presentation in, well, in three points, which also um, consists of the main research objective of this work. So first, I will present uh, a systematization of all the way that we have to transform waste into food and feed. Then uh, we will elaborate a life cycle assessment model, I will refer to LCA, uh, to be able to estimate and compare the selected pathways. And finally, we will use this model uh, well to be able to identify what are the best performing pathways and the uncertain, uncertainty in the future, but also on the deployment context and the technological performance. So let's start first with how we transform waste into food and feed. 
we developed a literature review uh, where we not only scrutinized the, the scientific literature, but also the patents and the industrial reports. So what we try to do is to capture the whole set of technical possibilities from the one already implemented down to the one only at the conceptual idea. So this review was already published, but today we'll mostly focus on the key point I think necessary to understand the results. So first of all, we need to understand from where we start. No, a residual biomass is quite of an heterogeneous um, family of streams that are widely different in terms of composition, but also in terms of, let's say, distance to direct edibility. This distance can be represented by these three features at the corners of the diagram. So first, they differ in terms of um, anti-nutritional compounds, which is harmful, toxic, such as mycotoxin, phenols, heavy metals, for example. So this is the case of sweat sludge, for example. They also differ in terms of structural complexity, which is uh, macromolecules that are incompatible with the digestibility of um, monogastric animals, for example. So it is the case of linear cellulose of wood and straw. And they also differ in terms of, of course, nutrient concentration of interest regarding nutrition, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. So here it's uh, kind of the edibility zone and the role of the waste nutrition pathway will be to deal with the specificity of each one of these streams and to bring them to this edibility zone. So reviewing all of this pathway, we uh, express them as a process workflow of unit operations that belong to those four categories. They mostly differ in terms of yield, which is uh, edible output compared to input, and in terms of composition change. So I will just detail each one of them so that we and give examples so that we really picture what we're talking about. So the first one is enhancement. It's basically a set of strategies that we gather together because they aim to nutritionally enhance also the digestibility or the acceptability of ingredients that are already close from being directly edible. So it can take various forms and really simple operations such as here, the milling of brewer's pen grains to formulate pasta. Uh, a representative family is the solid fermentation. It's the use of microorganisms to change the composition or the organolytic properties of a residue and to be uh, able to integrate them directly in um, common conventional food and feed uh, production. So for example, here it's a, as a dietary flower. So what they have in common, this set of strategies, they deal with the specificity of the input and they try to directly valorize it. Then we gather together sets of strategies that build around cracking operations, which is basically to dismantle the biomass down to uh, basic compounds, such as the monomeric, monomeric level or lower. So it's mostly applied to two types of streams. The first one is uh, linear cellulose. It's to make basically sugar out of wood and straw. So this is a process which already exists to make biofuel. But here, the challenge is to um, make a food grade sugar based on a hard pretreatment. So just to have some ideas, we can have around 200 kilogram sugar per ton of wood and straw, and with a total uh, sugar yield ranging 50-70%. I don't have a specific photo, but uh, this is a pilot plant. Uh, what is important here is that this process is really intense in terms of utilities and facilities. We also can apply cracking to uh, non-edible animal parts, such as the feather and bristol, for example, and we can recover edible amino acids with a relatively good yield. Then we have a set of strategies with already built around the extraction directly of proteins when they are already present. So we have many streams where we have proteins, for example, green biomasses, uh, leaves and grass and grass. They have around 10, 20 percent of proteins, so we can implement uh, on the dry matter basis, sorry. So we can implement a sequence of fractionation and refinement in order to have a protein concentrate, and we can yield around 10, 30 kilograms of protein concentrate per fresh ton of grass or, or leafy residues with a total protein yield ranging 15, 40%. So of course the final product depends a lot on the final refining, but this is what it can look like when it targets uh, animal nutrition. Of course we have proteins in many other streams, for example, sweat sludge, rapeseed meal, and all the time we have specific set of strategies to, to extract them. So I won't detail them all today. And finally, we have a set of strategies which build around uh, bioconversion, which is basically to use uh, the metabolism of living organisms. So it can be animals, but also microorganisms, microalgae, and so on. So of course, we, in a sense, we already use livestock that way often, but here it's mostly around uh, novel livestock, at least for the European context, which are the insects. 
So we have many species which exist here. The, the strategy is just to feed insects with residues and they gain biomass, basically. So we have many species, uh, but roughly they have a conversion ratio close to conventional poultry production. And of course, the, the performance depends on what they are fed on. When it comes to microorganisms, it gets a bit more complex because we first need to tailor the, the specific stream into a standardized fermentation media in order to uh, grow microorganisms of interest regarding nutrition. So it can take various forms. But one example is to the cellul cellulosic sugar that I just presented before. So we can grow, for example, microproteins. It looks like this. So this is already available on markets, not in France. But currently, it's mostly based on raw sugar. And here, the challenge is to make them based on residual-based sugar. So just to have some ideas, we can have around 200, 300 kilograms of microproteins per ton of glucose in a dry weight. So the total route from the wood or straw to the microprotein, it does not exist so far. Huh? We could achieve around 20, 70 kilograms of microproteins per ton. And the last family is the most indirect one, let's say. This one totally raised the specificity of the input stream and gasifies everything. So we have either through anaerobic digestion or gasification, we uh, convert the organic matter into gas, we purify those gas, and we fed those gases into bioreactors to just grow microorganisms of interest regarding nutrition. So it can look like this. This is pure uh, bacteria, so it's protein rich, and it can uh, be uh, included in livestock ration feed. So currently, the only scale project is based on natural gas, and the, the, the challenge is to make them based on biogas or syngas also. Well, uh, of course, here we have a sequence of processes, so the conversion efficiency depends on a lot of cascading conversion efficiencies. I uh, will be have the occasion to detail uh, afterwards. So what we saw is that we have a lot of ways to transform waste into food and feed. We classify all of these families into eight, but we see that they can act in synergies, but at the same time, they can compete for the same feedstocks. Uh, they mostly differ in terms of intensity, complexity of the commercial chain, also in terms of nutrient circularity, co-product generation, and so on. What they also differ is in terms of safety risk that are associated with this. So to refine the analysis only to the pathway likely or already implemented in Europe, we uh, try to identify what are the safety risks associated with each one of the input streams, and also to see if the waste to nutrition pathways really implemented some mitigation to this risk. So we review the European legislation and, well, just to summarize, roughly the biomass, if it can be considered as feed grade, is it, is it in the list of catalog, the catalog of feed materials? Or it's considered as waste in the list of waste. And of course, in this case, the reuse is strictly regulated. So what we consider is that uh, a feedstock labeled as feed grade was um, not um, posing particular concerns to divert them to any of the waste nutrition pathways that we identified. While in the case of waste, the only way that the pathway could sufficiently mitigate the risk was to go to the gas level, so cracking to gas, and also reconstruct the biomass afterwards. So, of course, we always have uh, some exception and we need specific considerations, but when adding to the picture, the fact that we need data to model all of the pathways, um, we arrive to those five representative uh, waste nutrition pathways that we will carry on to develop the, the detailed version of the analysis. So here, what is important is that the only pathway which is applicable to any feedstock regardless of its uh, risk statue is the microbial protein production based on biogas and syngas. Well, to wrap up this first section, well, we saw that we have a lot of ways. And when we um, take considerations such as risk, relevance, that availability, we refine the analysis only to five selected pathways for the life cycle assessment model. So now I will present this model um, to, because I think the assumptions and choices are important to interpret the results. So the first specification of such model is that it needs to be able to compare widely different biosource management pathways. So a first implication is that we take the resource standpoint, which means that the question is, was we have one ton of one residue, what do we do with it? The second implication is that we need a consistent modeling in able to be able to compare uh, incineration with insect farming, with composting, that we see that they provide different services, but we need a common comparative basis. So we implemented system expansion. 
So this uh, basically acknowledges the fact that the novel process produce a product that uh, provide a service, and this service will substitute the rest of the alternatives of, of the alternative suppliers in the markets. So this assumes that there is a demand for the service that exists regardless of my own process. So in terms of environmental impacts, we'll compare this uh, net balance, so the black points here, which is the balance between the impacts that are generated by the novel process and the benefits uh, of avoiding the, the alternative suppliers. Another feature is that it needs, of course, to be future-oriented. This is because most of the pathways they do not exist so far. So the first implication is that uh, when looking at the consequences of deploying a novel pathway instead of another one. So we have a dedicated methodology in life cycle assessment, which is called consequential LCA. And the other implication is that, of course, uh, we are uncertain about the future. No? Here we consider two poles of uncertainty. The first one is around the future technological performance, that is, my processes that are emerging, what would be their scale performance, I'm uncertain. And the mature pathways, what would be the future performance, taking into account, for example, technological learning and so on. The second pole of uncertainty uh, is around the deployment context. That is, tomorrow I might not avoid the same suppliers than today, and they might not have the same environmental impacts. Um, so this is, well, a conceptual uh, visualization of the model. So um, I will just detail each one of these blocks. First, we make this model uh, flexible to these 18 input characteristics, which are mostly at the biochemical level, but they were found, they were found enough to mostly segregate these different residual biomass families. Then, well, I mentioned that we selected five Western nutrition pathways, but as we saw with system expansion, uh, the way we will use the product will have a huge influence in the environmental performance. So we implement 15 variants. So here, insects, microproteins, and fermented streams that were as assumed to either supply food markets or field markets. Regarding the ex protein extraction, of course, we have a lot of co-products. So here we consider three different variants of valorization of these co-products. And regarding microbial protein based on biogas or syngas, we considered six different ways of gas upgrading. We've done the same for the conventional way we manage waste. So here, what you try to do is to capture the main one currently implemented in France and in Europe. So it's mostly around direct feeding of livestock, different type of land spreading applications, such as after composting, for example, different variants of combustion, such as within incineration plant or directly in the domestic furnace. Uh, and we also consider four variants of anaerobic digestion and uh, gasification for energy uses. So here, either the gas is used directly to produce heat and power, either the gas is upgraded and injected into the grid network for industrial uses. So we see that in total, we have 27 pathways. Of course, I won't detail all of them today, but uh, basically we consider the whole life cycle inventory and we, in a parametric fashion, and we made it flexible to the input characteristics, but also, of course, to the process performance in terms of energy efficiency, yield, the, the unit, I mean, the, the utilities and facilities due to any unit operation, um, emission factors of biomass handling, spreading, storage, and also the substitution rates of the products and co-products. So overall, we have 283 parameters of the model, and we documented each one of them uh, with the forecasted range of variation in the future based on specialized literature. Finally, we make the model uh, quite flexible to the context, which is the relation between the pathways and the world. So here, we mostly focus the analysis in four different markets, the energy, food, feed, and fertilizer, because this one are the one the most involved, let's say, with the pathway that we selected, either through the products, core products, or utilities that are involved. So as those markets will have key implications, the result I wish just to, to detail a bit their assumption behind them. Um, one challenge when it comes to consequential analysis is to identify the marginal suppliers and uh, the corresponding environmental impacts. So marginal here is really important because when I implement a novel process, I don't substitute the, the average of the rest of the alternatives, but only the one who are able to change the production capacities in function to change in the demand. So we have various ways to identify them. One is extrapolation of current market trends. So this applies for near future. But when we're looking at long-term future, for example, 
We can rely on prospective scenarios based on expert judgment when these are available, of course. And it's the case of electricity. So this is an example of France. Here you have two uh, production capacity of electricity in France in the 2050 horizon, so two different ones. And you see that they mostly differ in terms of total installed capacity, and they also differ in terms of the mix, so they mostly differ in the share of nuclear energy. But what they agree on, and it's the case of most of the prospective scenario for France, is that the increase in total power capacity installed will only come from wind power and, and, and solar, uh, wind power and, and photovoltaic, photovoltaic. So in our case, for our analysis, we can reasonably assume that the marginal electricity mix for France is renewable. So this has two implications. The first one is that my novel process can capitalize on the availability of renewable power, which is good. But the other implication is that if I have a process which produces electricity, I will only substitute renewable power. Well, it's not always as clear as for electricity or as documented at least. For example, regarding heat, industrial heat, well, the future uh, market of this is quite unclear. It depends on the future place of natural gas and European policies. It depends on the successful scaling or not of electrified heat system, for example. So we, we kept the model amenable to, well, these possibilities and we kept the baseline uh, to picture the current situation with biomass and natural gas. When it comes to feed services, uh, here we consider that feed markets, they are global. It means that the marginal suppliers of feed, they will come from regions of the world, the producer of the world, which contributes the most to the total increase in feed production. So for uh, protein feed, it's mostly soybean meal. For carbohydrates, it's mostly maize. And for lipids, it's mostly uh, palm oil. Of course, we have other crops part of this mix, but these are not represented here. And when it comes to estimate the environmental impacts, here we included land use change. This is because when I need one extra unit of feed, as I either have it by making more out of the same amount of land, so this is called intensification, or I convert more land, more land into arable land. So this is expansion, and this is what typically leads to deforestation. So in the last decade, roughly the extra unit of feed has been let, met by half-half. So we consider this as a baseline situation, but we consider that this can greatly change in the future because it will depend on global efforts to bridge the gap or to mitigate deforestation. So accordingly, the marginal protein, uh, the marginal feed supplies in terms of environmental impacts can vary greatly in the future. And this is important because this is what I will substitute at the end. Regarding food, um, well, here just to image to illustrate the fact that microproteins and insects are mostly targeting processed meat markets, but this is what they target. This is not necessarily what they will get. Maybe it will just be another option in the meat alternative. Uh, they won't, uh, let's say, convince meat eaters to, to take them. So uh, this is because the future uh, market boundaries between processed meat, meat alternative, meat analogs is uh, hardly anticipable. So we kept the model flexible to do this option. And in the base case, we take the best case, which is insects and microproteins avoid processed meat. So if I summarize the life cycle assessment model so far, we have a model that can compare 27 different ways of managing residual biomass. So of course, these are flexible to the input streams. They're flexible to the technological performance of each one of these pathways. And they're flexible to different food feed, energy, and fertilizer market contexts. So now that we have uh, the results, let's say not the results still, but we have the model and we have, um, we can generate the result and we have everything to interpret the results. So here is to identify which is the best pathway among these 27. So just as a reminder, the initial question was under which condition can I uh, transform waste into food and feed and that it really yield environmental benefits. So those conditions are around the future technological performance and the future deployment context. So how we use the, this model, we uh, screen the whole panel of future technological performance because we documented them with the validation range and we propagate this uncertainty to the results uh, using the Morris screening method. It's a stochastic one at a time uh, uncertainty uh, analysis. And it not only helps to identify let's say the parameters that are the most contributing to the uncertainty and the result, depending on the uncertainty of the inputs, but also to, well, to identify the variance of the output. So we repeated this operation 
uh, for different uh, deployment contexts, such as in a conventional scenario analysis. So the result that I will present, it's always the same functional units. It's the management of one ton of the stream. And of course, each stream is a different and individual case study. So this is uh, kind of the control panel. Here we have, uh, I will mostly speak about climate change today. Uh, this stream is the wheat straw. And here, this is the context so food, feed, energy, and so on. It's in the baseline configuration as I just presented before. So here we have the distribution of the uh, climate change performance of 27 different ways of treating one ton of wheat straw. So the further the left, the best for the climate and the other way around. So in gray here, these are the pathways that at most provide a fertilizing service, such as composting or direct decay on soil, for example. In red, those are the pathway mainly, mainly targeting energy service. So here it's the four variants of direct combustion. Here's the four variants of anaerobic digestion and gasification to do energy. And here in blue, those are the pathways um, mainly involved to produce novel feed. So here is the six variants of microbial protein production. Here it's microprotein production. And here in yellow, it's when I substitute processed meat. And in blue, it's when I only substitute animal feed. I mean, I, I give the microprotein to feeding to livestock. Here it's solid fermentation. I won't speak about insect farming uh, nor protein extraction because these are not compatible with uh, this, this stream here. And finally, we can directly uh, just give the straw to uh, as a livestock feed. So at the end here, we want to know the best pathway, but most options are overlapping. So we implement a, a paired simulation design, which means that for each simulation point, we're able to compare one per one all the, all the pathways. So what it means that, for example, if I have two pathways, I can implement this discernibility analysis. That is the frequency over all the simulation, that is over all the potential future technological performance, that one pathway is better than the other. So of course, this does not, it's not helpful when it's, when there is no overlap, it's obvious that, for example, here, uh, making energy recovery from straw is always better than just letting it decay on the soil. But for example, in this case here, uh, well, we have an overlapping, but it's only apparent. It means that the yellow one is always better than the blue one. So avoiding processed meat is always better than avoiding animal feed, which is a bit obvious maybe, but this analysis can be repeated to cases that are more ambiguous. For example, here we have the 50-50 distribution um, of, um, here it's mycoproteins to substitute um, processed meat, and here it's straw combustion to make energy. So here, what we're interested in is to know what are the factors that favor one over the other. No? So due to the uh, experimental design that we develop, we can develop statistical analysis on all the results. And uh, here we can align the set of parameters that contributes the most to preferring one pathway over the other. And often it's mostly due to one or two parameters. For example, we can yield such statements such as, okay, if the enzymatic hydrolysis yield is higher than 70% for microproteins, and they really substitute meat higher than 80% of the weight basis, then doing this pathway, so producing microprotein from straw, is always better than burning straw to recover energy. So we can repeat this analysis for each one of the pathways of interest that we have, but what we need to keep in mind here is that these numbers, they are highly dependent, of course, on what we consider here. So here I just speak about climate change. Here's just one stream, which is with straw, and here it's depending on this, specific context, and particularly with the fact that in all the study, we have uh, unconstrained renewable power. So to see the, if this conclusion can remain uh, in different contexts, uh, we assess, well, different uh, heat, first heat market context. So first here, we consider uh, two options. The first one is that in the future, we still remain in the same situation than today, which is natural gas as the main marginal heat supplier. This is the worst option. And the best option is that in the future, we already have a decarbonized heat system. So we see, you see that there is a huge difference in terms of environmental impacts related to these two. So of course, this has huge influence in the results. Um, mostly here, the one that are targeting energy production, of course, here, the, the further the left, uh, it means that uh, the more natural gas in the marginal heat supply. No? So this is logical because if I avoid natural gas, I would perform better than if I avoid something which is already decarbonized. No? 
But you see that uh, also the waste nutrition pathways that are affected, and this is because these they require heat as part of the utilities. Also, some are net heat generator due to the co-products that, uh, that you can valorize or sensible heat recovery. So here, what is important at the end is that uh, depending on the context conclusions that change, if I am in a future where natural gas is still the main marginal supply of heat, then making energy of, of straw will always be the best option that is regardless of the rest of the performance of the pathways. On the other hand, if I already have, uh, let's say, decarbonized heat service at the marginal supply, then making feed, in particular microbial floating here, would be the best option, even if not at the top performance. We also assess the impact of the marginal feed supply on the results. So here it's the best case scenario when um, the future feed production would be much better than today in terms of environmental impacts. And the worst case, which is kind of business as usual development of food system where the marginal impacts of, I mean, the impacts of marginal feed supplies would be better, uh, worse than today. Of course, this massively affects the results, uh, but here it only affects the one that produce feed. And what you see here, the first to the left, it means the worse the way to conventionally produce feed. So the more deforestation and so on. So of course, the worse it is, the best it is to produce alternative feed ingredient from waste, which is logical, but here at least we can quantify it. And as you see, they are not affected the same way. Some go faster than the others. It's because it depends on their own conversion yield. Uh, at the end, over all of these feed market context, the best one, because this is what we're interested in, it remains between those three options. So we can draw this kind of graph, which is the distribution of the best option among different feed market contexts. So how do we read this? It means that in a feed market context where uh, my marginal protein feed supply generates around two kilograms CO2 equivalent per kilogram of protein feed in this context, around 80% of the simulation is better to make energy out of straw and around the 20% remaining is better to make microproteins. Of course, this distribution is changed depending on in which market context we are. And we can see that from six onwards, it's always better to make microbial protein. It means regardless of the technological performance of the rest of the pathways. Here, uh, what you see in yellow is that microprotein uh, substitute processed meat, but as we saw, it's not necessarily the case. If they do just substitute plant-based meat alternative, they are no longer part of the best option. And here is just a transition phase between making energy from straw and microbial protein. And you see that here is the current situation uh, is that I estimated now. So we're still in a situation where it's better to valorize straw as energy than to make microbial protein. Uh, well, as you imagine, we have a lot of data to analyze because, well, I just spoke about climate change, but we have a well other impacts. We study eutrophication, we study land use, water use. And uh, we only worked on uh, wheat straw, but it's not representative of all the results stream in France. And we also repeated this analysis for different case study. But hopefully we found some uh, common trends, let's say. So here, the first common trend is between linear cellulosic residues. So as you see, it's mostly the same pattern. So under optimistic future uh, food system making energy from uh, those linear cellulosic residues remain the best option. That is regardless of the performance of the waste nutrition pathways, even under the, the best performance. But under pessimistic food system uh, development scenario, then microbial protein become the best option even under suboptimal performance. We also found a similar trend between nutrient rich rates, which here is represented by manure and sweat sludge. So here, what you see is that from five onwards, microbial protein production from anaerobic digestion is the best option, regardless of the uh, technological performance. But below three, more or less, then anaerobic digestion and composting are the most competitive alternatives to manage this waste. Of course, all the time I say better, it's among the 27 that we analyzed. Huh? Uh, this is an interesting case. It's the case of residual streams that are already edible because uh, most of them, are, you have a lot that are already used as animal feed. And what we see here, everything is orange. It means that regardless of the future technological performance of any pathways and regardless of future market context, it's always better to directly feed edible streams to livestock. It just means that. So there is an exception. Uh, it's if insects really substitute meat. In this case, they become the best option 
regardless of the, their performance and regardless of the future field market context. So we see that we have a lot of, let's say, results. So just to summarize in the, these findings, here we have three uh, categories of streams with common behavior. So the first one is feed grade. So what do my model uh, recommend to do, let's say? First, we should uh, assess if there is room to enter, uh, to substitute meat, for example, incentives, or if there is room to directly include those streams uh, in human food. If not, then direct feeding to livestock is the best option, according to, to the video. Then for linear cellulosic stream, the first condition is, is natural gas still part of the marginal heat supply? If yes, then I, I'm better doing energy to substitute this, man, this natural gas. If not, the best pathway is between microbial protein and microprotein, depending on the forecasted yield that they can achieve. Finally, regarding nutrient rich waste, we also have the same condition around um, the natural gas. So if we still have natural gas, then it's better to make biogas from these streams. But if uh, we already have other options to make heat, then um, mostly making microbial proteins would be the best option, provided a minimum yield. So now we're in the, this situation, now we're in a situation where edible streams, they should be eaten directly, either by us or by livestock. And we're in the case of the rest of these streams, well, they are better directed towards energy recovery. This is also the case if the global meat demand will start decreasing or if the rest of the solution towards sustainable food system are implemented, because this will lead to lower impact of feed production on the ecosystem and will lead to the fact that it would be better to do energy with residues than making these advanced pathways. Well, if meat demand keep growing, or if the global line speak globally, and if the rest of the solution towards sustainable food system fail to be implemented, then uh, microbial protein production would be uh, based on mostly anaerobic digestion or gasification, would be the best option, even if they remain at the current yield. So if I can summarize these findings in a few, uh, let's say, take home message, I would say that transferring waste into food and feed is not an environmental mitigation option, particularly today we saw uh, concerning uh, climate change. These options, they mostly build on the fact that the rest of the solution will fail, so they are not synergistically enhancing the rest of the solutions, but they can be, let's say, a palliative option in case of business as usual food, future food system scenario. Then residual biomass are no free lunch. Uh, well, this is because we need process to transform them into edible ingredients first. And also because uh, residual biomass, they already provide often services or they could provide services. So we need to account for, let's say, the lost opportunity environmental costs of, of these constraint streams. And finally, well, most of these pathways are not implemented still. So the, anyway, we need to improve the current way we uh, manage the organic streams. We have a lot of enhancement to do, for example, treating emissions of anaerobic digestion, uh, I mean, limiting them, uh, also sequestrating um, the emissions of composting facilities, best practice of land spreading, for example. So in the few minutes, I'll just take if I have, oh yes, I have, to, I have some uh, that remains. I will mostly, um, well, discuss the research that I've been doing so far and what are the next perspectives. So uh, today I'm mostly focused on the model a bit, but mostly on the findings, but it's important to note that we are the first to propose to address waste to nutrition as a whole. It means all of this option comparing a single framework. We, well, it was, today it was synthesized, but in the thesis manuscript, we redocument the implication of deploying each one of these options. We also propose a method to unravel the future world of technologies uh, under different sets of uncertainties. And of course this, was today applied to waste to nutrition pathways, but it can be applied to many other technologies emerging as part of the bioeconomy. Everything that we provided were, is available in open access to be reused, also to be appended or to serve as the basis for a scale version of the analysis. Because if I can, well, uh, mention one key shortcoming of this work so far is that we still lack some quantitative uh, evidences of the role of such pathways to comply with sustainability objectives. Because today, mostly I said one pathway is worse than is the best, but we still lack as they're really uh, um, efficient in order to reach sustainability goals. 
So this is what we're trying to do now. We will scale the analysis to uh, not only consume one ton, but the whole set of residues available in France, and we'll add the demand in products and services to the picture. So uh, we also wish to link this resource and demand because as you see here, all those numbers that are linked, huh? the, the amount of meat that I consume determines the amount of manure that I have to handle and determines the protein feed, for example. So see the interactions between all of those in different uh, projection of consumption and production. And of course, make this model, well, 27 sounds a lot, but at the end, it's just a small set of bioeconomy pathways. We still lack, for example, transportation, biomaterials, biochemicals. So the goal is to increase the number of pathways considered, uh, which is in the framework of the Cambioscope project. Uh, yeah. So uh, a question that can uh, frame a bit this scale analysis would be how to allocate the set of resources that I have in a given area of decision, territory, national scale to meet the demand in product and service while I minimize the total environmental impacts. And of course, today I just mentioned climate change, but we have the rest of the impacts often with trade-offs that we need to deal with. So one tool to mobilize could be uh, multi-objective optimization, for example. So we've done everything at the end is to guide decision-making and bioeconomy planning. Uh, this is because we have more and more, uh, let's say money, but towards a transition. So we need to be sure that the investment, um, they are really aligned with sustainability objectives and to be sure well, of the consequences before uh, investing. No? So this is just key features of EU farm to fork uh, strategy. So in this strategy, uh, well, wood farming of insects to produce feed ingredients will, will be relevant. Wood transforming wood into protein be relevant. According to our study, I would rather suggest that no. But uh, this is how this work can be used, for example. So in terms yeah, of the resolution of the results, uh, so far uh, we published two studies, which is the literature review that I already presented earlier. And we also published a specific uh, case study on uh, solid fermentation. Uh, I did not have the chance to present today, but you can ask me uh, if you're interested in. And uh, regarding the conferences, I uh, already participated to two, and I have the, we summarized, let's say, the, the the key result in uh, in two weeks in the CETAC conference. Uh, yeah, the main result, of course, and the models are still under finalization for the for submission. So, uh, well, of course, of this work has not been performed alone. Now, I wish to first uh, thank uh, thank you, um, Laurie Amla and Vijay Barna, which are my main advisors. Also to Michael uh, Odonue, Ernesto Rosero, and Massimo Pisol for the key inputs to this work. Um, they were the quota of the paper. And thank you to all the colleagues uh, that for the fruitful exchanges and the three years. And uh, well, thank you all for listening and looking forward to the discussion.